call the meeting to order and welcome everyone to this, the 10th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2017. Can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent. Agenda item one is a continued petition um, and evidence taking on petition uh, 1517 on polypropylene mesh medical devices. So we have only one item of business today, and that's a consideration of the petition, petition 1517 on polypropylene <coughs> mesh medical devices lodged by Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy, who are in the gallery this morning. Can I welcome Neil Finlay, MSP, and I understand that Jackson Carlow, MSP, and Alec Neil, MSP, may be in attendance at a later stage in the meeting. We're going to hear evidence from two panels. First is Tracy Gillis, Chair of the Independent Review Group, and she will be followed by the Cabinet Secretary for um, Health and Sport and the Chief Medical Officer. Members have a note by the clerk which provides context and background to the Session 4 Committee's consideration of the petition and then addresses the content of the final report of the Independent Review of which members have a copy. Members also have a copy of the most recent submission from the petitioners, which sets out their concerns about the final report. These concerns include the provision of the shared decision tables, Chapter 6 reporting of MESH adverse events, recording of MESH procedures, the classification of MESH, and the inclusion of the petitioners' input within the final report. So there are a number of areas to cover, and I propose, therefore, to move on to the first evidence session. And I welcome Tracy Gillis, Chair of the Independent Review. Can I thank you for attending this morning, um, and you have the opportunity to provide a brief opening statement, after which we'll move to questions. Thank you, and good morning. Um, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to come here today to discuss the uh, Independent Review and to answer the questions that you have. Um, as people who are here today will know, the review came about because of growing public concern about the use of polypropylene mesh to treat urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. And through the considerable efforts of those who have suffered complications after having surgery, you will uh, also be aware that Leslie Wilkie, who chaired the review in, from the beginning through to the publication of the interim report and beyond, resigned towards the end of last year and I was asked to take over the review at the end of last year and see it to its conclusion. Under Leslie's chairmanship, the Independent Review published an interim report in 2015, and a lot of work went into that report, and it was well received by clinicians and patients. And clearly, and other, Leslie and other members uh, did a lot of work to produce that report. Before talking about the findings of the review, it's probably important to touch on some of the difficulties that the review uh, faced in coming to its uh, final publication. And I think it's important to acknowledge that it is uh, deeply disappointing that one of the clinicians and two patient members felt they had no alternative to resign, but to resign. And I, I want to explain that I did uh, really try very hard to find common ground and compromise so that a final report could have been produced that all members were happy with, and I'm very sorry that that didn't happen. As is often the case with a review or, of in or inquiry of this type, there were many uh, experiences and strongly held views amongst members, and in those circumstances, it proved to be difficult to reach agreement, and in particular, consensus around some of the views around the interpretation of the evidence. But the review's final report was published at the end of March, and the, review, the view of the remaining group members would be that it actually strengthened the findings of the interim report. Oh. And included eight clear and ambiguous conclusions that I would want to have the opportunity to go with you, uh, through with you today. Definitely. It is really important that we conduct the proceedings as um, efficiently as possible, understand the level of emotional feeling in the room, but we have to take evidence, we have to ask questions and then come to a conclusion. So if people can, um, as much as possible, uh, restrain from commenting while we're trying to take evidence. So broadly speaking, those conclusions cover the very important point that decisions around treatment, and in particular in these conditions, must involve patient-centred care, which includes patient choice and shared decision-making, which is supported by robust clinical governance. 
and to support shared decision making that should take place in the context of a multidisciplinary team. That recording and reporting of adverse events should take place in line with the GMC guidance and that uh, we, have, uh, con we have reached a conclusion that we would include the word mandatory on that and I'm sure that you'll have some questions about that. That patient information and the consent leaflet that was previously created should be reviewed and that there should be a similar uh, leaflet produced for those who are considering prolapse surgery. That the expert group wanted to highlight some of the gaps around the long-term impact of mesh surgery and wanted to highlight those to the research community so that further questions could be addressed uh, to that. And that there was a need to work to address the information gaps that currently exist and to make sure that information that is currently available is used as effectively as possible. And that the expert group should uh, review the training and information available to clinical teams and find ways to make sure that patient views are incorporated into the recording of the NDT outcomes. And that in uh, considering surgical treatment for stress urinary incontinence, women must have the opportunity to be offered all appropriate treatments, both mesh and non-mesh, as well as the necessary information to allow them to make informed choices. And in the case of pelvic organ prolapse, that mesh procedures must not be offered routinely. And I'll happily return to that, because I, I think that that is where actually there's a move in the um, conclusions of the final report beyond that of the interim report. And in coming to these conclusions, the independent review members considered the best available evidence and that uh, one of the reasons for the gap between the interim report and the final report was that new evidence became available. That evidence drew on a wide range of different sources. These included patient surveys as well as stories submitted individually by women to the review or separately to the Scottish Government. Other evidence included the analysis of nationally available hospital record data that's carried out by the Information Services Division, and that was in Chapter 4, and then a number of different scientific studies, and those uh, were uh, included in Chapter 5. So as I touched on earlier, it was uh, deeply disappointing that three members of the review felt that they had to resign, but I want to make clear my gratitude to all members for their efforts in bringing the uh, report to the place that it got to. And in coming to the conclusions, the remaining members of the review group did take care to consider and try to reflect the views of those members who had resigned. And that, I think, is uh, in part what we would see as the uh, inclusion of the word mandatory that we knew was very important uh, to the patient members of the group. So I want to conclude by thanking those uh, members who took part and the many women who have submitted stories. And I hope and firmly believe that as the conclusions taken, uh, brought forward in the report are taken forward, that the standard of care provided to women will improve. Because I think that there are many important lessons to learn from the events that preceded this review and from this review itself. And I hope that these will improve care in the future. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much for that. If I can maybe um, open up the questioning. One of the issues behind the petition being brought forward was that women were not being listened to and that their experiences were not being treated with respect by clinicians. How would you respond to the views that have been expressed by the petitioners and others that the review was not fully independent and lost its transparency and integrity? And can they reasonably be expected to have trust in not just the conclusions that are reached, but the processes that are followed to get there? And if I can give you one example, I'd be interested to know your comments on this. In the interim report in Chapter 6, it says, the independent review expressed serious concern that some women who had adverse events found they were not believed. In the final report, that changes to, the independent report expressed serious concern that some women who had adverse effects felt they were not believed. In the difference between these two reports, are you not effectively saying, are, uh, compounding the idea that these women were not being believed. Because so, you're not believing that they were not being believed. So, so that was not the intention of the report in any way? <laughs> I suppose my question to you is if you can um, reflect on this, why there's a lack of confidence. Can you explain that change? What was the, what was the purpose of that change? Which 
it, it, it reported that people felt they were not believed rather than the earlier one. Clearly, the, the, the interim review had accepted that, or the interim draft had accepted they had not been believed. So, so, so I think it would be important for me to say that there was no intention in it, any implication. There was no intention in any implication that people had not been believed. That, that in the, I, I chaired two meetings of the group, and really I went to um, a lot of effort to try to make sure that we were trying to listen to all views around the table. But how do you answer this question? How do you give people confidence, as the question asked you, that it was... When people are saying it's not, it didn't feel fully independent and it wasn't transparent, what's your response to that? So, so I would refute the fact that it, it was not fully transparent. I, th I think that um, one, of the, um, one of the issues, I think, is over the tables of evidence, and it might be useful to explore that at this stage, because I think that is what has led people to worry about the transparency of this. So the tables of evidence that were included in the interim report in Chapter 6 were drawn up by one of the clinicians and, uh, and contain extracts from the full critical appraisal. And one of the, uh, in the discussion with the clinicians, what became clear was that there were some feelings that, that certain things may have been highlighted rather than others. And so, actually, the, the chapter five in the report is the critical appraisal of the evidence that is uh, collected through systematic review. And what I wanted to make sure was that there was really clear visibility of all parts of those systematic reviews. So that is why the tables in Chapter 5 can appear more difficult to read, but they do contain... They do contain every extract from the systematic reviews that have been undertaken. And when it seemed difficult for some people that the, the um, tables from Chapter 6 were being included in Chapter 5, we've included those cut-down cut tables in front of the full tables, and we've included a link to the interim report Chapter 6 at the back, so those tables at the back. So, so, so actually, one of the difficulties that we have when people... Uh, talk about the assessment of evidence-based medicine and how that evidence is being assessed is which parts of the evidence have been taken and looked at. And so I wanted to make it actually very, very clear that all the evidence that was involved in those systematic reviews was set out in Chapter 5, and that's why that is there. Okay. And well, in that case, can I just ask you, did you believe that some women who had adverse effects found they were not believed? Do you think that was their direct experience? I think that women who have had adverse effects have not believe, been believed, and I'm very sorry that they weren't believed, because they should have been. So the final report doesn't reflect that view, the interim report does. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I can only apologise for that change in wording. That's not the intention. OK. OK. Again, can I just remind the gallery that we, we are trying to, through the evidence, as, a, as effectively as possible. Can I move to uh, Angus MacDonald? Okay, uh, thanks, convener. Um, good morning, uh, good morning. Ms. B Before we move on to the report's conclusions, um, I'd appreciate some clarification from you yep. uh, in relation to the process for publication of the report and the petitioner's uh, resignations. Yep. Um, the petitioners are clearly very angry that their names and input have been included within the report when they requested that these be removed. So can you clarify for the record when you received requests from the petitioners to remove their input and whether these requests were agreed to. And for any requests that were not agreed to, can you explain why this was the case and who took that relevant decision? Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, I have a, n a number of letters which I'd be happy to provide at a later date to the committee if that would be helpful. We'll take as much information as you can provide, yeah. Okay, so, so I will be happy to do that. Um, the, um, uh, the, uh, as, I, as I understand it, following a meeting between Mrs Holmes and Mrs McElroy with the um, Cabinet Secretary, there was a request that then she then put to me for information to be removed. 
I wrote and asked for clarification about which pieces of information uh, was to be removed. Following that, there was clarification from the minutes of the meeting of the um, uh, Scottish Mesh Survivor uh, Women with the Cabinet Secretary, which stated that it was the minority report that was to be removed. So, so, so that I, I understand that you may not agree with that, but that's the information that I received in discussion with the group, that um, there was a l very strong feeling from the remaining members of the review group that individuals, after they have resigned, should not be able to influence the content of the... <laughs> should not be able to influence the content of the report as the review group, as it stood at the end, had agreed. The minority... Um, report was part of an appendix um, and had not formed the basis of discussion within the process as the review was formulated and that's why that was uh, removed. I had received communication asking me not to, uh, that it was causing, dis my letter had caused distress for which I'm sorry, but following that I did feel it was necessary to actually be clear about what had been removed. So I did uh, write a further letter, but that letter was sent by post. Okay. Okay, and, and, sorry, are you continuing or have you... Sorry, no, I, I think I've, I've finished the end of what I've tried to answer in your question. If, you, if I haven't answered any parts of it, could you just tell me the parts that I haven't answered? Well, it would certainly be helpful if the committee, if you could provide the committee can, with the correspondence course, yes. that you had, um, because there may be a suggestion that... Uh, uh, some of that wasn't received. I'm not sure, but we, we would be obliged if you could provide that. Of course. Okay. Neil Finlay? Yes. Could you advise what correspondence you received from either the Cabinet Secretary or the Chief Medical Officer in relation to the request from the patient representatives to remove the information from the report? So that was, was, in a, that was in a discussion? Well, uh, did that discussion f go along the lines of I have met with patient representatives. They want all their information removed from the report. So, so yes, it did, and that's. And you didn't do that. So, as I've outlined before, that's the th that's what I wrote to Elaine and Olive to ask them no, no, about. No, 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 no. Sorry, that was the report you received from the cabinet secretary. Verbal. She, she made that request to you. Yes, you've just confirmed that. Yes. And you didn't remove that information. So as I've explained to you, I wrote asking that. I then took that suggestion but you back. Don't, you don't need to write because the request has been made by the Cabinet Secretary, who you're but accountable she, to. No, so she is passing on what was discussed in their meeting. There she, was agreed, a, she agreed at that meeting. Well, th that that I, would I'm be afraid you would need to take that up with oh, her. Oh, don't worry, we will. But, so I am trying my best to navigate a difficult process where people have different views, and, f and some of those are understandably very, very strongly felt. But the discussion about um, the integrity of the review and the fact that the review group have agreed the content of the review it was actually, of course, I take that responsibility very seriously as chair, and I need to go back to the standing members of the group who have not resigned about any significant changes in content. Um, it, it's right to listen to requests, but that doesn't mean that I would necessarily accede to those requests. That's but the point. On, on that, on that theme, on that theme, then when the when the interim report changed so much to the final report, yep. did you reciprocate that arrangement and contact others within the group who may have, um, who may have resigned or who were members at that time and who um, rejected that position? So, so that was fully discussed at the meeting. There was a meeting held at the end of January and there was a meeting held on the 6th of March. So the changes to the review were fully discussed as part of those. And, it, and the agenda sets out chapter by chapter that each chapter was discussed. OK, that will do for now. I'll come back in later. 
And were all members, of the, the remaining members of the review group would have been in attendance at both of these meetings? So all the papers were circulated to them of those who did not attend either in person or, or by phone. And the um, conversations, uh, the, the, um, so, for, so if, I, if we come, back, come to the word mandatory, then that was clearly very important <coughs> to those uh, people who had suffered complications following MESH. And although the group had previously discussed the inclusion of the word mandatory and, um, and not felt that that was the way to go, at the meeting on the 6th of March, what we, what we added into the review was the statement about the GMC and the GMC's expectations for individual practitioners to report complications. But when the word mandatory was still... Uh, the, the absence of that word was still clearly a source of, um, of deeply felt upset to, um, to individuals. I, I did agree to go back to the group and to check that they were all right. And at the meeting, I said that, that I would, if you like, take chair's prerogative and accept that that could be included, because it seemed to me unreasonable to hold out against that. Okay, can I just... Um and forgive me just for the, for the record, does the final report reflect that some of the people who are members of that group had resigned and therefore that some of the evidence that had been given and provided by them, they had asked to be withdrawn? There's no commentary on that in the final report? The, the, I mean, I understand your, your position seems yeah. to be that whoever remains in it, who's still standing at the end of the process, are the review group, and that's their report. Yes. But is there any commentary around it that says... Well, actually, during the course of this, we lost the two patient members and we lost um, So in the expert. list of people at the back, it does give the dates when people left? But what it doesn't do, it doesn't reflect what, the, in a sense, what the substance of the dispute was that led to them going. So there is nothing that, that shows what was the bit that people might have liked to have removed but wasn't removed. It does, does, doesn't okay, reflect so, that, even that request. So, so I, I would be... Um, I have, when uh, members resigned, I've written to them thanking them for their contribution and expressing my regret that they had resigned. And I would be very happy for those letters to be part, uh, to be on the website. I would uh, be happy to reflect the comments that you've made to me today um, and for that to be put up on the website next to the review that actually it didn't make clear what were the points of dispute about why people had re resigned and what they had wanted to have removed. I think, I, I think that if, uh, if part of the difficulty about trying to produce a report where it's uh, it's written by multiple different people and we're trying to build an area of consensus is that um, it, it's not... If people choose to leave that process because they, um, they are not happy with the conclusions, it, it's not possible, I think, to disaggregate contributions that have been made in the course of development of the report. Mm. But if, for ex if, in an extreme circumstances, if there'd only been two people left writing the report, might you not have taken the view that it was unsustainable to produce a report? And I wonder whether, when to the two patient members said they had no confidence in the report, when another member left, you might have thought, well, rather than ploughing on with a report that's not been able to build a consensus, we might just pause here? Did that, so, was that a consideration? So, so we did have another patient member who remained as part of the group, and we had a number of other individuals who who also stayed as part of the group. So I think you're right. If, if, if one was left as chair of a, of a group of two people, one would clearly have to say this is not something that, that is credible um, to the various audiences that, that um, one would expect a, a report to go to. But actually, um, there were still a very significant number of members of the review left, all of whom were in agreement with the content of the review. Okay, if we can maybe make... Jackson, were you wanting to come in briefly here? Um, presumably at the point when the interim report was uh, made public, all the members of the group at that time uh, supported the interim report, uh, including those who subsequently felt necessary to resign. Now, I learned something from what you said a moment ago, and I'd like some clarification of it, because clearly until... Uh, your predecessor resigned in November, 
uh, we had a group who were supporting the conclusions of the interim report. And I heard you say in relation to the tables, I felt that these uh, excerpts uh, were not giving the complete. I felt and I decided and I led. And what I'd like to know, um, Dr Gillis, is it, is it the case that it was at your instigation that the review committee's interim report was changed on the basis of what you felt having come into that review and that you led that change within the, uh, within the review group to the new report? Or did the initiative come from elsewhere within the review committee? People who by this stage were so concerned that they had managed not to express any of these concerns when the interim review was published. So in listening to the clinicians discussing how they would want to frame the conclusions uh, of the clinical part based on the, the, remember between the interim report and the final report, there is new evidence that's come forward. That's yeah. the reason for the delay. In, in listening to that uh, discussion, it was very clear that there was a lack of consensus around the content of those tables, that actually they were no longer agreed by the clinician members of the group. There was no longer sufficient consensus for people to feel comfortable around that. So the initiative came from you? As a way of trying to say, is there a different way that we could um, express this in order to continue to build consensus. Which was essentially what? To produce tables that just produced a blizzard of information which then made nothing clear at all. <laughs> so it was the lowest common denominator. Nobody could disagree with anything, basically. So, so I would absolutely refute that. I think it does come down to who is the intended audience. And I have made a comment previously that actually I can understand that for... Um, uh, that, that that level of information can be difficult to navigate. But I think what it does do is set out each of the outcomes that the systematic reviews considered rather than a selection of outcomes. Okay, and long. actually, for a report to be sufficiently credible to influence clinical practice, it needs to be very transparent for clinicians and for the broad for the broader clinical group to be able to uh, read through that and to see all the different outcomes that might be considered. And that becomes particularly important in the case of surgery for stress incontinence, where there is no single procedure that would provide um, a... Um, if you like, a very cl uh, there's no single procedure that one would say was a reasonably standard choice. Each of the surgical options, and I think it's important to take a step back from that and to remember that treatment may be non-surgical before it's surgical, but each of the surgical options has a range of risks, of potential benefits, and of complications, and those differ. So, uh, actually, it's quite important to make sure that all of that subtlety is set out. Okay. Uh, Rona Mackay? Um, I have to say I'm really struggling to understand your explanation of the tables um, and your view of transparency. I have to just put that on record. I really find it very hard to understand what you've just been saying. But can I move on to my other question? Um, the petitioners um, state that the interim report were into great detail about procedures, whereas the final report covers seven procedures in less than four pages. And they also argue, for example, that the suggestion that the trans curator mesh tape can be removed clearly contradicts what all clinicians agreed on in the updated and approved patient information leaflet. So how do you square those two? So <coughs> this is not my area of te technical expertise, but that, but that particular point was expressly discussed by the clinicians and there was agreement that that was the correct wording in their surgical experience. So they, uh, they it, well, it was agreed on in the interim report, but not no, in the final report. No, so, what so, so I think I think that it even use it themselves. So, so, so I think even that what has happened in the time between the interim report and the final report is that that surgical uh, 
probably surgical experience has moved on. And so that was why they, um, they felt that the statement that was made in the interim report about mesh via a trans route not being fully removable, they would want that to be altered. That was a, that was a clinician-led decision in terms of the content of the report. But that's not what it says in the patient information leaflet. So, so, so there is a recommendation for that um, information uh, leaflet to be reviewed. What, reviewed as of now? Okay. Do you think that's acceptable then, to put out a leaflet for patients so the, with information the, that's actually not valid? So, so, so it's important that all information is reviewed on a regular basis as practice changes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. okay. Um, Maurice Corey. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Guinness, um, on the issue of mess adverse events, it is to be welcomed that the report recommends that it should be mandatory to report all adverse events. But I'm interested in the process of the review uh, undertook to eventually reach that decision. Could you outline the decision-making process uh, on that specific point, including the timeline uh, for when the recommendation was included in the final report? So the, uh, the inclusion of the word mandatory was included at the very end of the finalisation of the report. And as I've previously discussed, that followed the conversation where the uh, MESH survivors group had expressed their view to the Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary wished to uh, meet me to make sure that I understood the depth of feeling around those reviews. The, uh, the meeting on the 6th of March, we had had discussion around the use of the word mandatory. It's really the implementation of the use of the word mandatory that the group thought could be difficult. But actually, at the time, it seemed unreasonable to, um, if that was a strongly held view, it would seem appropriate to, to actually go back and include that. And I checked that back with the group, and it was agreed. Right, OK. Thank you. OK, uh, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good morning, Dr Gillis. Um, looking at the evidence basis for frequency of adverse events, in their submission, the petitioners say that they made repeated requests for what they refer to as best study of mesh adverse events published in the journal Nature to be included in the report. Yep. It stated that the study shows one in seven women experience serious adverse incidents of mesh, yet the study is not mentioned in the report. Can you explain the evidence that the review considered and how it decided that the inf what the information to be included or not included within the report? And was there a particular reason for not including the study the petitioners refer to? Yes, I can. Sorry, I have a number of notes. Um, that study was, um, uh, as I understand it, uh, circulated through the uh, group by the clinician, uh, by one of the clinicians prior to my uh, arrival in the group. There was no discussion at any meeting that I attended about whether that study, uh, people wish to include that study. In terms of the evidence that is included in Chapter 5, it falls into two broad groups. Those... Um, uh, safety reviews that uh, were included were focused on safety reviews published by agencies charged with device safety. And in terms of efficacy, uh, sorry, effectiveness, then Cochrane reviews were the systematic review method that was uh, used. The Nature Review doesn't follow the guidelines for a Cochrane systematic review report. Um, and so it was not um, considered... That what um, there were, I suppose, at least three opportunities uh, when, um, if the clinicians within the group felt that there was important evidence that that um, uh, paper covered that they thought was a, uh, a gap from the review when it could have been discussed and included. <laughs> Okay, so what you're basically saying is you know, there's a frequency of the, the petitioners asked many times for this to be included, but you never, you so, were never so presented the, for that. So any ask for that to be included was not at the time when I was the chair. Okay. Um, the petitioners are clearly concerned by the information contained within Chapter 6 of the final report, which they believe directs the reader to the conclusion that mesh procedures are better than non-mesh ones. <laughs> yeah. They are, of, they are of the view that it describes all the advantages of mesh procedures, but avoids mentioning adverse events such as mesh erosion and exposure and chronic pain. 
It then highlights the disadvantages of non-MERS procedures, but none of the advantages. How would you respond to petitioners on this point, and could you outline the extent to which you consider the final report to address advantages and disadvantages with equal importance? So, uh, I would disagree with that point. I think that um, what Chapter 6 does is it sets out a synthesis of how the different strands of evidence might be used by a clinician. I think that, importantly, it considers non-surgical options around treatment and tries to um, uh, place an important emphasis that surgery is not the only way for these conditions to be treated. Um, the it's really a, um, a, a view from the clinicians of the group, and so I, my view, my, um, I guess my role as chair is to draw those views together in what has been set up as a multi-author review, rather than to uh, pass judgment on the uh, technical um, uh, views that are contained within that. The report also says uh, that this chapter is now used to explore some of the nuances of clinical interpretation of the evidence presented earlier. Can you explain to me what exactly that means? So, so, um, there are, there, so that's what I was trying to say in the beginning, in the opening statement. The review contains different uh, types of evidence, if you like. So some of those are quanti uh, quantitative results from research trials where different trials select a narrow group of the population, randomise them between different treatments, and then those trials are put together um, like different layers in a Cochrane review. So trying to see from looking at the way to that narrow perspective for, for randomised trial evidence, whether there is a, um, a, a particular benefit or a particular risk profile related to a particular treatment. There is also the type of evidence that comes from the study that was produced by ISD, which takes routinely collected hospital inpatient day case activity data, which is, if you like, taking outcomes from a much broader population. It's a much more pragmatic way to look at what the outcomes are. And then the review also contains qualitative evidence, which is based on people's experience. Wow. Can we just, again, can I just ask people, I do understand the scale of feeling in the room, but we really do want to try and proceed as efficiently as possible. Um, Neil Finley, you're indicating you want to come back? Um, can I, uh, I, I cannot get my head around the um, dismissal of the, that report on adverse incidents that was um, published in uh, the journal Nature. Do you, do you find that strange that such a up-to-date report on adverse incidents was not included in such a review? I find that remarkable. <clears throat> so... Uh, I have come in at the end of... I know that, I know all what, that. So, uh, so, so I, I, actually, you know, you've asked me here to answer the questions, and I think it's important that I'm allowed to, to, to make a comment, that I have come in at the end of a process uh -huh. which has been set up in a particular way. Yeah. If I had started the process, I may not have chosen to um, approach it as a chair in this particular way, and that's not to imply any criticism of the previous chair. But actually, the, the review has obviously run for a, quite a considerable length of time. And where things come forward, if they don't necessarily neatly fit into one of the chapters that has been set out, then I can understand why people might think, oh, why didn't they consider that? Um, the, there were opportunities when if any individual member of the group or, or people who are far more steeped in the current evidence around this particular area of practice had felt that it was important for that review to be included, then I, I, am, I am quite confident that there were opportunities for them to raise that. So do you find it remarkable that it wasn't? I don't have that clear review, actually, because it's... Um, I, I wouldn't want to make a comment on the, on the actual 
technical validity of the, the, of the way the study was done. Sorry, sorry. sorry. More I question thought, briefly, and we're going yeah, to move um, on. What about the um, FDA's alert on counterfeiting in the US, and what about the European Union's change of mesh from medium to high risk, and the fact that the report still concludes that it's medium risk? Mm -hmm. and, can, and, and my very, very final point is, Dr Gillis, and I've I've always been reluctant to ask this question to any of the, uh, uh, the women involved in this. I would find it much more easy to ask this question if I was a woman. But given what you know about MESH, given what you know, mm -hmm. if you suffered the same um, condition as many of the women behind you, would you have such a procedure done? I am um, rather... Um, unclear about the validity of asking me a personal question about my own health in this don't, setting. Or would you, you, reco would you recommend it for someone Neil, else? You don't have to answer that question if you don't uh, want to. So if you could answer the, the, the first point that was made to you, and then you can choose to answer the second point if you yeah, want. Yeah, sorry. In terms of the uh, thinking about the second point, I've slightly lost track of the first sorry, point. The, so, sorry, the, could you just repeat The counterfeiting the warning by the FDA okay. and the EU's classification. Yep. So, um, the uh, MHRA are the regulatory body for uh, devices in the UK, and they were part of the group, and they attended, and those uh, particular um, points were expressly discussed on the 6th of March, and that's the, um, that's the input that has gone into the final review. So, the regulatory body in the UK has been part of the group and has been, if you like, responsible for that content um, and that's clearly set out the FDA are not the regulatory body in the UK in terms of the second question I um, I think it is important to uh, really say that one of the difficulties around this is that we're at the um, forefront of what is a necessary and important change in surgical practice and that is a change from a more professionally-led view about what might be the right procedure for somebody to a much more participatory, equal relationship between professional and patient. And that is a difficult um, thing to navigate, but it's a very important change that we need to make. And it then becomes the role of the professional not to say what they think should be done for an individual, but to find out enough about, for that individual, what are the things that are important to them, and to then provide them with information that allows them to navigate and come to a shared decision about what is the right decision for them to have in terms of a surgical procedure or not. That requires far more skills from professionals than we currently necessarily provide them with in terms of being comfortable about asking some of those questions and not providing the normal professional response. So in answer to your question, in terms of if that was me, I would want to make sure that the professional that I was dealing with was able to give me an explanation about the different risks and benefits of the different options and to also find out from me about the things that would be important to me and to come to a joint decision with me. I um, have to say to you that I have considered that question myself. Um, I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to give you the answer, but I <laughs> think that what we have tried very, very hard to do in conclusion seven and eight in particular, is to set out that surgical options for stress urinary incontinence, none of them are, a, if you like, a clear option to choose. Each one of them has different risks, benefits and complications. And actually, it's not possible to look at the evidence and say, choose this one or choose that one. And that is what makes it complicated to understand. The thing that we have actually, and I realise that this did not go down well when I said it at the beginning, but actually the thing that we think that the final report has strengthened is actually around the use of mesh in prolapse. There is now 
clear evidence of no benefit for the use of mesh in prolapse. And that is the thing that has changed between the interim report and the final report, because it is based on the evidence that the final report was waiting for. And all that available evidence points in the same direction. And I think it is an important but subtle difference to point out that evidence of no benefit is stronger and clearer than no evidence of benefit. And so actually, that is the thing that we have tried to move forward in the final conclusion. OK, thank you. Um, Maurice Corey. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> Moving on from the issue of the mandatory reporting of MESH adverse events to the non-mandatory reporting of MESH procedures, I note the figures that say um, <clears throat> currently only 27% of surgeons record MESH procedures. Systems are dependent on whether information is being input and on the quality of the information that goes in. I would simply ask you to respond to the questions raised by the petitioners in this regard, and how would it be possible to obtain accurate information on adverse event rates if the recording of procedures is not made mandatory? And how, if recording is not made mandatory, will more surgeons use the current recording database? So I think those are important questions. The, the, uh, the purpose of the review is not to provide um, an implementation mechanism that uh, I think one thing that we have highlighted is that the, um, what was previously uh, the expert group, as it moves to an oversight group, needs to be very clear about how they wish recording to happen and to make sure that our systems are there to support that. But I completely agree with the point that it is uh, it's not possible to understand about the instance of adverse events if denominator information isn't clear. So it's important, obviously, to make sure these are recorded? Yes. Right. My apologies, I meant to take you earlier, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I just clarify how many members um, of the review group signed off the, the final report? Um, I could go and count, uh, sorry, I, I can't give you an absolute number, but the, the all, so we were quite careful, given the difficulties, to make sure that every member who remained at the end signed off the report. So in terms of the number of people that are listed in the appendix of the members, each one of them signed off the report. Okay. How, how many were in the group, the review group? So it's a, between 12 and 15. It's a number of that order. Right. And they were happy to sign off the final report, even with all the changes, if yes. they'd been involved in the, in the, in the interim? Okay. Yes. Can you say honestly now that you feel in this uh, final report that the the views and feelings. You, you came into this as a new chair. You must have been aware of the controversy surrounding these procedures. Do you, are you happy that their views have been reflected in this final report? So um, I am aware that particularly of the people in the room, based on their um, very real experience, they have very strongly held views. There are many other people whose, whose voices are are less audible, and the, re the report does try to um, acknowledge that. I think that my... my um, so, so I wanted to make sure that the review actually came uh, out into the light of day, because there are actually many women who are unsure of what they should do, and there are many clinicians who are actually far less clear now about... Uh, you know, prior to the review being published about what was or wasn't the right thing to do. So actually, in terms of the totality of people for whom this is important, it seemed to me that the right thing to do was to try to bring the review to publication. And I, I want to just... I, I understand that, but can I put it to you that the, the people in the room, it's not their views, it's their experience? Yes, I'm so, so, sorry, I'm sorry that it, uh, if I've phrased that incorrectly, that's not at all what I meant to imply. It, I absolutely understand that is their experience. As and opposed you, feel, to you. you feel that, that, that their experience, um, as severe as, as, as it ha has been, has been reflected well enough in the report? Well, I, I'm sorry that that is felt to be the case. I think that also reflects the views of the whole group about why they uh, would not want to see pieces of the review removed at the final stage because people had resigned. 
I, it, it, it's, it's almost mission impossible from the beginning. Um, and that, um, that, that um, I, I think what's important is to, that is, one, should, one should always reflect and think, could I have done things differently? Mm. But actually, actually, I do think that what we have produced is a report that has tried to look at all the available evidence and has tried to assimilate that. And that actually, from the quite um, respected clinicians who participated um, from Scotland and from elsewhere and from the professional bodies who participated, they have signed off a report that they feel is uh, balanced and that reflects the current state of the evidence. Just ask, when you said it was Mission Impossible, do you mean you had a Mission Impossible coming in at the point that you did, or that having this review at all was a Mission Impossible? No, no, impossible? sorry, that, that was my... That's a personal view around my... So, so uh, as you said quite correctly, it was clear that there were strongly held views of difference at the um, point that I came in. So, to, so w one could say, uh, more for me for agreeing to... Um, to, to chair this. This is not um, something that most people would have um, uh, welcomed to be the wrong word, but it, it's, it's clearly going to be a very difficult thing. And I, I personally have reflected and feel disappointed that I have not achieved what I would have set out to do, which would have bring, bring this uh, in, in consensus. And I, I hear the, the voices from behind me, and I feel very... Sorry. Um, uh, no, I, I feel sorry that I have not achieved something which, which brought something together where people felt they were able to stay as part of that to the end. And I am personally sorry that that has not happened. And if that is, uh, you know, any fault of mine, then, then I, I would want to acknowledge that. But, but I think that the, the reason why I accepted what I might describe as Mission Impossible, and that's my personal view, is because actually for the totality of, of women who may face this problem, I thought it was important to try to uh, bring the final report to a conclusion so that there can be the necessary improvements to information and clinical governance and discussions around treatment options. Okay, thanks very much. Can I welcome uh, Alec Neil, MSP, to the meeting? and ask Angus MacDonald to ask his question. OK, um, thanks, Convener. Uh, obviously, this isn't an issue that's been looked at in uh, Scotland alone, uh, as Neil Finlay um, has, has already alluded to, and, and the risk classification of MESH is an issue that's been brought up by the, the petitioners. Uh, indeed, the, the, the previous committee in Session 4 um, took the opportunity to raise the issue uh, during a visit to the European Commission uh, in Brussels. Uh, which, uh, which is on record. Um, the, the final report anticipates the reclassification of MESH devices as Class 3, uh, the highest risk category. So this is clearly an issue that's been raised by the, the, the petitioners. And looking at the timeline, the date of reclassification as published online was the 8th of March, and the final report was published on the 27th of March. So can you clarify whether there was an opportunity to update the final report? Um, that is uh, so. So we, the the final meeting was held on the sixth of March. In between other um, ag ag agreements around wording, that uh, was not one of the things that was raised and discussed. But I, I would um, again point out that we did obtain uh, individual um, sign off from each constituent member about uh, whether they were happy with the, the content of the report. So it was not raised as that something that we could have amended. Um. So why, why exactly was that not raised? Do you, do you, do you know why? Uh, the, the, it's, it's a reason of omission rather than commission. It's not, it's not deliberate in any way. OK. OK, can I go back to my previous question at the start of the session with the indulgence of the, 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 the convener? Mm -hmm. Um, just for the record, um, 
With regard to the issue when the petitioners resigned, as I understand it, the petitioners resigned on the 4th of March. So can you confirm what was added to the report following the meeting uh, on the 6th of March? And um, was that referred? Uh, did, I think you said it, there was some reference to the GMC. Yep. Could yep. you perhaps clarify that, please, just so for the I record? I can clarify that. Um, it is the uh, statement that says that that uh, it's the statement that references the obligations on a professional to report um, adverse events um, to the necessary regulatory body, who in this uh, case would be MHRA. So, if you wait, I'll find it. So it's in Chapter 8, uh, from memory. It's on page 91. It's under the summary. It says, the reporting of adverse events is therefore mandatory, and that's the part that was added in later, as we've already discussed several times, that word was added in. But the part that was added in after the 6th, following the discussion, was the reporting of adverse events in line with a good medical practice, a good medical, uh, the General Medical Council's good medical practice, which states that in, uh, to help keep patients safe, clinicians must report adverse incidents involving medical devices that put or have the potential to put the safety of a patient or another person at risk. And it gives the uh, link to that part in good medical practice. Um, and then it sets out that the MHRA is the organisation that should be informed. OK. Thank you. Can I just ask, um, in, in response to Angus MacDonald, the, 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 there was a reclassification that was reported on the 8th of March, and the final report was published on the 27th of March, and no one thought that this report, this reclassification, Merited. Was it not something you were waiting for? Was it not something you were aware was going to happen? I so, mean, I, I get that something might have happened in the world and nobody noticed, but this is the thing that this report was focusing on. <laughs> this was their job was to look at this. It was reclassified, and no one thought, "Wait a minute, does this have any impact in the report that we're going to issue on the 27th of March?" So, uh, in terms of how it would change practice, it would not have any. Um, other implications in terms of the way the mesh is, mesh is currently used. And, and I think... No, sorry, if, if it's my understanding as yeah. a layperson, it's moving, it's, it's acknowledging a higher level of risk. Yep. It's moving from medium to high risk. Is that not significant in a report that's reflecting on the risk involved in this procedure? So um, that point was explicitly discussed uh, at previous meetings with the MHRA, and if you would wish, I could provide you with an extract of the minutes that uh, outline that discussion. But, but would you not think it would be extraordinary that nobody was keeping an eye on what this reclassification conclusion was going to be? I mean, you've, uh, my colleague here has said that this was something that was raised with the European Commission. Yeah. So it was something that would have been in the minds of people who know a great deal more about it than I do. That in the same way that the interim report was waiting for a report to inform its final yep. its findings, yep. would this not have been one of those list of things to take a note of before you sign off the report? Yes, I, I, I understand that point of view, and I'll happily um, come back to you with a written view about that and provide you with the extract of the minutes. So to say that it's an omission, I think what we would be interested to know, how on earth could it have been a Yes, and I, I, I would say that that's a fair okay. point. Thank you very much. Can I just, um, just a final question here, unless Alec or Neil, I'll, I'll take Alec Neil, Neil and then I'll ask my last question. Okay, thank, thank you very much indeed, convener, for uh, allowing me to participate in the committee. Can I, can I just explore the relationship with the MHRA? Because um, we are told that that is the regulatory body for devices. Now, there are a number of issues here. 
Uh, first of all, in my view, the MHRA has totally failed in its responsibility uh, to the people across the UK, not just in Scotland, in terms of what it's not done uh, in this area. But leaving that aside, that's not the responsibility of you or the Scottish Government. But the MHRA, um, the, have you checked out it, whether the Scottish Parliament, particularly under the new powers, uh, now has the ability to transfer responsibility in Scotland for regulation from the MHRA to the Scottish Government? Has that been, was that checked out as part of the committee's work? No. Why was it not checked, why was it not checked out? That is not something that was... Um, so, so when I came in as the chair, then essentially it was this re review is pretty much concluded and we need to now try to move that on. It was not to start unpicking other opportunities to explore. Um, well, well, that's a fairly much fundamental issue because clearly many of the changes that were taking place, and I, I'm not a lawyer, I, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying that it has been changed. I just think the committee surely should have checked uh, whether there was any scope at all for the regulatory function in this to be transferred from the MHRA to the Scottish Government. So, so and you're say, the saying the committee didn't look at that. So my understanding of what the review was set up to do was that it did not include that um, as a question to be answered by the review. I'm sure if you'd asked the cabinet secretary to extend the review, she would have uh, allowed you to do that. Um, the second point is that the MHRE is res the regulatory body for devices, mm -hmm. but the control of what can be funded through the National Health Service in Scotland is controlled by the Scottish Government. Therefore, despite the MHRE failing in its responsibility to properly regulate these devices, the Scottish Government surely has the power, and certainly I did uh, as Cabinet Secretary for Health because I exercised the power, not to allow procedures which may be using devices which may be unsafe the, the National Health Service in Scotland has the power to say that that will not be done. So was that explored by the committee? Uh, that, I, I do think that's a, committee, uh, that's a question that's not for me as the chair of the review. Well, I've asked, did the committee look at it, look at that issue? That, that the, the opportunity to... Um, make a recommendation for the Scottish Government to exercise powers about not undertaking procedures through, through regulation, then no, that, that's not what my understanding of what the review had been set up to do. Well, I, I been, set it up and I certainly yeah. would have intended that that okay, would have so, happened. So, so then I can only apologise, that message was... Uh, yeah. So, um, that's not the, uh, the brief that I received. Well, certainly, if you look at the terms of reference, there was nothing in the terms of reference to stop the committee asking these fairly basic questions, uh, given the concerns that were around about uh, these devices. Uh, because although the, the, the regulation of the devices is um, apparently still with the MHRA, although that should be checked, I think, uh, the issue of whether, even if the devices are legal, whether the National Health Service in Scotland actually yeah. allows the devices to be used because we are funding the mm -hmm. procedures so, yeah. is a separate question, and that okay. clearly lies within the responsibility of the National Health Service. So, so, so I, um, I, I think before you arrived, I had uh, commented about the uh, previous chair who had obviously undertaken an awful lot of, of hard work and had set up the review in a particular way. And so I am, I, I do not know her, I have not spoken to her, and I... Did you speak? So, um, I, her, her reasons for resignation... Can people just calm back down again, her, please? Uh, her reasons for resignation are not known to me, and so I um, would need to respect that. I have yeah. taken the review from the point where it was at the end of November in 2016, and so I think your questions 
uh, obviously, I, I, you, if you establish the review, then, then you know what you had in mind. But I do think those questions are probably more reasonably addressed to the previous chair than to me if they were well, questions that you wish to see explored in the beginning I of the, the review. I think the question is for the whole committee. Um, and clearly, since you've taken over the chairmanship of the committee, um, I think um, it would have been reasonable for the committee, particularly given at the same time as the committee was reviewing this whole issue, simultaneously there was legislation going through the, the UK Parliament and this Parliament to transfer um, substantial additional powers across a wide range of mm. areas. And it just seems to be that it would have been logical and sensible to just double check the scope for taking back regulation of the devices from the MHRE, which, as I say, is not an impressive organisation, mm -hmm. in my view, to put it mildly, back into the Scottish Government's mm -hmm. remit. Uh, but, okay. okay. I mean, I suppose... Sorry, Neil Finlay, very briefly. So... You never, uh, you had no conversation with the previous chair, is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, there was a report came out from the European Union changing it from uh, medium risk to high risk, and the report does not reflect that. We had members of the report um, granted before you joined it who um, went 10 months without meeting. Uh, were excluded from subcommittee meetings, could not access the minutes or the agenda of those subcommittee meetings. And we have a number of members of the committee who it has been suggested have conflicts of interest. And much more. Uh, is it, are you surprised, therefore, that people see this as being a report that has become a whitewash? Yes. So, I can only reiterate what I've said previously, and that is I have done my best from the place that I started in to try to include the views as I heard them and to try to uh, make sure that we um, produced a report that considered the evidence as we'd been asked to do and that actually produced a report that was credible and tried to set out as much of the evidence as possible. Okay. Can I just, in conclusion, um, I'm just conscious of time, we need to move on. You have said you found this to be mission impossible, and there's a number of issues. I think that people are surprised the committee didn't um, investigate, and that might have been prior to your time. They didn't respond to this question of reclassification. Personally, I'm surprised that you didn't have a conversation with the previous chair, but there may have been... There may have been personal yes. reasons yes, on I behalf of the other chair for that. Correct. But it would have been interesting to know if there was any um, attempt to have that conversation, at least to have a kind of a handover mm -hmm. um, point in that, which doesn't seem to have happened. But I wonder, rather than... Um, I mean, there's now going to be a review of the process involved in independent review work. Rather than asking you to outline all of these now, I wonder if you are prepared to kind of make an input into that independent review from your place coming into the process late about particularly this dilemma about when a point when a body is broken because so, so many people have walked away from it um, I mean do you think that if a report is trying to bring together the views of practitioners clinicians and those of had experience if those of had experience have walked away then the argument with just simply with the clinicians is that not diminished in some way? So, so I, I could I, I, I think it would be important to remember that we, we did have another individual who had experience who did remain in the group. Um, but in answer to your first question is I would very much welcome the opportunity to speak to somebody undertaking uh, a review of, 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 the, of this particular process in order for future processes to be improved. Okay. Um, can I thank you very much for coming along today. I think... Um, if there are things that you want to add to cool. your evidence, I think there are a number of things you've highlighted, um, please contact the, the committee. We're more than happy to receive either what you've already committed to or any other further evidence or comment that you want to okay. add. That's been a, um, a fairly long session. I appreciate you have been um, on your own doing that, and I know how difficult that can be. So I thank you very much for your attendance. Can I suspend till we change witnesses?
call the meeting back to order? Can I call the meeting back to order? Can I just can I just remind everyone? Can I just remind everyone that um, we are constrained in time because we have to be finished by um, 12 o'clock. We've already been given permission by the Parliament to extend beyond the normal time. So I appreciate we're under pressure. I appreciate just how important these issues are, particularly for people who are visiting the Parliament today. It's important that we manage to get through, as I said earlier, um, as efficiently as possible. I'm hoping to finish questioning by about half past 11, um, but in order that the committee can consider what we've heard, but it, we can extend slightly beyond that. But I, I just hope that everybody can um, cooperate with that because I don't want anything, any opportunity to get evidence to be missed. I recognise the level of interest in this, but also recognise the time constraints that are placed on us by issues beyond our own control. So if we can move on to um, the next part of the meeting, can I welcome to the, uh, Shona Robinson, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, and Catherine Calderwood, the Chief Medical Officer of the Scottish Government. Can I thank you both for attending this morning, and I'd invite you to provide a brief opening statement before we move to questions. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. I, I welcome this further opportunity to speak to uh, the committee and members of parliament on this important topic following the statement I made in the chamber at the end of March. The independent review came about as a result of the efforts of many of those affected and who strove to make their voices heard. Indeed, two of those women, Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy, who submit, submitted the petition to this committee, later directly took part in the independent review. Before I outline the, the Scottish Government's response to the review's recommendations, I'd like to inform the committee, and I have written to the convener about this, that I've commissioned Alison, Professor Alison Britton, uh, who is a Professor of Healthcare and Medical Law, as an independent expert to examine and report on the process of the independent review. Professor Britton currently works in Glasgow Caledonian University and is a specialist in public health care, clinical negligence, mental health law and professional ethics. Uh, Professor Britton will produce a report on how the independent review process was undertaken and, importantly, what lessons can be learned in the future. Turning to the report, uh, upon the report's publication, the Chief Medical Officer wrote to the chief executives and medical directors of all health boards about the review's uh, conclusions. In particular, the chief medical officer highlighted the conclusions around the circumstances in which mesh, mesh pr procedures should and should not be offered in the case of both pelvic organ prolapse and stress urinary incontinence, and also made clear the importance of health boards ensuring that detailed and patient-friendly information is available to all women. This information must be provided so that women can make careful, fully informed decisions on the best treatment in their case. In addition, the CMO has also instructed all health boards to limit the number of surgeons that carry out mesh procedures and to ensure the mandatory reporting of adverse events. The Scottish Government will establish an oversight group which will be expected to work with health boards in taking forward the conclusions of the review. This will include working on guidance for nationally agreed pathways, publishing patient-centred versions of sections of the independent reviews report, and producing leaflets on pelvic organ prolapse and post-operative information, and I expect patients to be involved in the oversight group's work. I can also confirm that Scottish Government officials continue to work with colleagues across the UK to explore a MESH registry pilot, and the development of e-learning packages are being considered for use in general practice. What I want to be absolutely clear about is the key safeguards that are to be put in place as a result of this review must be implemented before any procedures using MESH are reintroduced routinely to healthcare services in Scotland. The Chief Medical Officer has met with the medical directors of the health boards to gain assurance that these measures will be in place. As those here today know, during the concluding stages of the independent review, three members felt they had no choice but to resign from it. This was, of course, deeply disappointing and it caused me a great deal of concern. I met with all of McElroy and Elaine Holmes after their resignation because I was very keen to hear directly about their concerns and indeed put those to the chair of the independent review when I met her, which I did. Turning 
to the original petition that was presented uh, to this committee in 2014, it is worth briefly considering the demands contained within it and what progress has been made towards meeting them. First of all, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the petition called for the suspension of the use of uh, polypropylene transvaginal mesh procedures. And, of course, the Scottish Government requested that health boards suspend the use of mesh until the independent review published its final report. As I've said, routine service provision will only re recommence once the medical directors and chief executives are assured that the recommendations have been implemented. Secondly, um, it, the calls to initiate a public inquiry and or comprehensive independent research to evaluate the safety of mesh devices using all of ed evidence available, including that from across the world. And of course, the independent review was initiated to fulfil this request and that has now published its final report. Thirdly, the introduction of mandatory reporting of all adverse incidents by health professionals. And of course, the final report makes clear that this is mandatory. And fourthly, the setting up of a Scottish transvaginal mesh implant register with a view to linking this up with national and international registers. The Scottish Government officials are exploring this with colleagues in NHS England. And fifthly, the introduction of fully informed consent with uniformity throughout Scotland's health boards. Health boards will be required to make every woman fully aware of all of the options available to her in her case. Sixthly, the, to write to the MHRA and ask that they reclassify mesh devices. The reclassification of surgical mesh has been under consideration by the European Commission and it was adopted by the European Parliament on the 5th of April of this year. Uh, so, just in conclusion, convener, um, despite the concerns raised, uh, which I understand fully, I believe there has been some progress made on the issues raised in the original petition that's before the committee. Happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much for that. Obviously, we, we did receive information from you um, last night about this review of the review. Um, do you not think the fact that you're having a review of the review might suggest there may be a lack of confidence? in the final report, and I wonder whether in those circumstances is it a possibility that you would revisit the actual independent review itself? Well, look, I accept that, from the, particularly from the point of view of the women who came to see me and expressed this very directly to me, that I know that they, how they feel about the, the final report. They feel very strongly indeed uh, about that. And, one of the reasons I wanted to get uh, an external expert to look at the independent review process was because of the, those, those concerns and the fact that members resigned, the fact that a clinician resigned, none of which is the way we would want independent reviews uh, to, uh, to be conducted. Now, without looking at um, the reasons in, in detail of that, uh, I, I think it would be a missed opportunity to look at, and this isn't about looking and revisiting the evidence, it's about looking at the concerns that are raised about the process, uh, what lessons can be learned about independent reviews in general, about understanding uh, uh, the, the roles and responsibilities taking part in independent reviews, and indeed looking at the, the way the evidence was uh, presented and, and the decision-making uh, around that and the governance around that. So uh, you know, Professor Britton, I think, would be the right person to look at that, which I hope will give us uh, recommendations that will help us to make sure that uh, independent reviews going forward, of which there will be more, um, I am sure uh, that the lessons are learned and we can hopefully avoid some of the issues that uh, happened with this, within this independent review uh, process. But, but if the process was wrong, if you've got the balance of evidence between the professionals and those who had suffered as a consequence of these procedures, you've got that balance wrong. If that's what the professor established, what does that say about the final report? Well, we need to see what Professor Britton says about the, the process of the independent review. Uh, and we'll have to wait for, for her to uh, undertake that work. And she will meet with the, everybody who took part in that independent review uh, process. Uh, it is without a doubt been a very, very complex and difficult process for, 
for all involved, um, dealing with a lot of very complex clinical information. Um, and uh, what I want to do, though, is to, fo to uh, and I've asked Professor Britton to focus on, uh, during that process, are there things that could have been done uh, better? If so, what are those uh, those recommendations for going forward in the future so that, if possible, we avoid some of the, the difficulties uh, that this independent review uh, faced over the, the time that it was established? I don't want to labour the point, but if any, the professor looking at the review <coughs> establishes that the process, process actually had an effect on what the final conclusions were and the capacity of those conclusions to have a consensus and agreement around them, surely that would take you to the place where you would then have to go back and revisit that review itself and look again at what those conclusions were and what that would then inform practice in Scotland. I mean, would that well, not... Well, uh, look, I'm not going to prejudge what Professor Britton comes up with. I think we need to wait for her to do that work. But obviously, I wouldn't have asked her to do the work around this independent review if I didn't have concerns uh, about the independent review and where we ended up with it. Clearly, there, there were concerns, um, well-established concerns. So I think we need to wait to see what Professor Britton says about that. She will speak to everybody involved in the independent review and she will bring forward recommendations. I'm not going to ignore those recommendations, so let's see uh, what recommendations she brings forward and, and uh, what her analysis she brings so to the process. Can you confirm then that the moratorium will remain in place until the conclusion of the P Professor Britton's work and your response to it? Well, the, it's very important that the recommendations from the final report uh, are, are implemented, not least, not least, not least, Sorry. because if you look at some of those recommendations, for example, on the mesh for prolapse, it says that that should not be routinely uh, offered to women. And that's an important recommendation. Mm -hmm. If we were not that, to implement with, with that, then that would that's not, not be... What I, asked you. I asked you if the moratorium would remain in place until Professor Britton, I mean, that's a pretty substantial point. That moratorium, which matters a lot to people, I think, will that remain in place until such time as you have received and responded to that report? Uh, well, the, the suspension, as the Chief Medical Officer has made clear, the suspension uh, will not be lifted until the recommendations of this report are implemented. The recommendations are important, not least, as I've said, that MESH for prolapse uh, it is stated in the final report that that should not be routinely offered. Uh, so we have to accept that even during the suspension uh, that we called for uh, for health boards to, uh, to, to not have these procedures going ahead, because it is not a banned procedure, many procedures still went ahead because it was down to the choice of women and the full knowledge in discussion with their clinicians whether or not, in the light of their concerns raised, whether they still wanted to go ahead. So even during the process of suspension, because this isn't a banned procedure, only the MHRA can ban this procedure and they have not done so. And therefore, therefore it is important again. that the, the recommendations which tighten up these procedures are put in place, not least the mandatory reporting. That's something that the women have called for. This report put, calls for mandatory reporting. If we were to do nothing and not implement this report, then the mandatory reporting wouldn't be implemented. So there are elements of this report in the recommendations that are very important. But the moratorium will remain in place. Well, the suspension will not be lifted until the medical directors can assure the CMO that these recommendations are in place, like mandatory reporting, like making sure that the, the recommendations that are clear have to be put in place. And the CMO has been very clear with medical directors that all of that has to be in place before these procedures are offered on a routine basis. And I think that's very important. Angus MacDonald. OK, <clears throat> thanks, Convener. I think we'll be coming back to mandatory reporting before um, the, the, the close of the session. Um, however, can I just um, refer to uh, the petitioner's submission um, dated the 8th of May uh, to this committee, um, which stated, and I quote, following the resignation of the ex-chair, Dr Leslie Wilkie, in November 2016, and the appointment of Dr Tracy Gillis, a serving medical director, this became a government review rather than an independent inquiry. The review has simply lost its independence. The current final report is clearly a whitewash and the recommendations expose women to unnecessary harm. 
So what reassurances can you offer to the committee, the parliament, and most importantly, uh, the petitioners, that this report is the conclusion of a wholly independent process and that women can be assured that their experiences have been listened to and that they can have trust in the conclusions of the report and also the processes uh, that led to those conclusions and recommendations? Um, well, uh, first of all, obviously, Leslie Wilkie's resignation was unfortunate. It was for uh, personal reasons, as she's uh, confirmed uh, to me uh, in writing. Um, and, of course, Tracy Gillis taking over, it was a, a very difficult um, uh, position to take over. Um, it is a very uh, complex issue and one where there was very strong differing views, uh, not least within the, the clinical group within the independent review. It is not unusual for clinicians to disagree, and within the independent review process, they did disagree. Um, and uh, that has been one of the issues that, uh, that has um, uh, been uh, discussed on a number of occasions. In terms of Tracy Gillis, um, uh, her position, uh, I'll let the, the CMO say a little bit more about uh, that, but it is important to note that uh, Tracy Gillis, um, in the time that she took over uh, within NHS Lothian, was actually after the... Do you want to say a little bit about the time frame? So uh, Tracy Gillis had been medical director in Forth Valley, which has not done any procedures using MESH since June 2016. She has then taken up a new position as medical director in NHS Lothian on the 1st of February. So she was um, in a health board which was not performing the procedures at the time she was appointed to be the chair of the group. OK, that, that, that still doesn't give us an assurance, uh, at least the petitioners, an assurance that they, they, they have been, been listened to. And g given that you've uh, mentioned Tracy Gillis, there was uh, some concern, I think, uh, at the, earliest, uh, the earlier evidence session, that Tracy Gillis had made no attempt to contact um, the previous chair. Um, now, clearly, there may have been personal reasons for that with regard to the previous chair, but would you have expected at least an attempt to have been made to contact the previous chair? Um, I, that would be a judgment for Tracy Gillis about whether or not she should contact the, the previous chair. The previous chair did resign for personal reasons. Now, you know, it's um, not for me to go into what those personal reasons were, uh, but clearly she couldn't commit uh, the time uh, to uh, this process. Uh, in terms of whether there, there should have been a handover, I mean, these are matters really that the, the chair would have had to have judged in terms of whether she felt it was necessary to make that contact or not. In terms of continuity, perhaps there would have been some uh, advantage uh, to doing that. Uh, in terms of your, your, your question about the, you know, whether or not the, 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 the women f felt that the, the independent review process has uh, been a, a, a positive one or indeed has come to the conclusions that they would have liked the independent review to come to the conclusions. Clearly, that, that, that is not the case. The independent review hasn't come to the conclusions that the women wanted. In fact, from most of the correspondence I've had from women who have been adversely affected by MESH, the conclusion they wanted the independent review to come out with was a ban on MESH. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, that could never have been the case because only the MHRA can ban MESH and indeed it is a procedure that is approved for use within the UK. Now, I uh, believe that the MHRA uh, uh, in, its, um, in the evidence that's given here, uh, I know there's been criticisms of that evidence. I've written to Jeremy Hunt to ask him what his view is of the, the way that MHRA goes about its business and whether there are lessons there in terms of whether they can improve uh, their communication and the way that they take evidence. Um, but that, I, I'm not in charge of the MHRA. That lies elsewhere. Uh, but they are a key organisation within this process and they are the only organisation that can ban a procedure. Uh, I can't ban that procedure, and that's why during the suspension, women were still able to have the procedure if 
they consented to that and were fully informed about the risks. And we know that that happened during the, the process of the suspension. I very specifically want to come in on this, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I was a member of this committee in 2015 when we heard evidence from the MHRA. Mm -hmm. It was some of the most deeply unimpressive evidence I have heard in my lifetime, frankly, never mind my political career. It was patronising, it was arrogant, but much more fundamentally, it was crassly superficial. Now, I don't think they should have been part of the review committee, but that's neither here nor there. But here comes the point. I have heard you say... And I've written to, I've spoken to the First Minister, asked the First Minister in the Chamber. I've, um, I've asked questions of you about the MHRA. The responses you've been received remind me of when I was a boy of a programme called Hogan's Heroes that used to have a Sergeant <laughs> Schultz in it, whose response to everything was, I see nothing. And that has been the MHRA's response. But I want, because I'm concerned that this is a skirt, Cabinet Secretary, that you are hiding behind. So let me ask you, you say that the MHRA is the only body that has the power to ban this, and it's a UK reserve body. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But if you had the power, would you ban the procedure? Well, if the MHRA were a devolved organisation that reported to me and they said that this is a medical device that should not be used, then of course I would accept that evidence. But I, I'm not a clinician. I can't decide what medical devices and uh, procedures should I be banned understand. or not so banned. Actually, the fact it's the reserved is irrelevant. Review. What you are saying is that because the body, which I believe has fundamentally failed in its analysis and its contribution, but it doesn't really matter whether it's reserved. If the body was reporting to you, you still would not be here today implementing a ban. So if you're saying to me that a body that is designed to say whether or not a medical device or procedure should be banned or not banned, and they tell me it should not be banned, and I was to say as a politician, well, I'm going to ignore that and ban it anyway, that would be irresponsible of me as a politician. I'm not a clinician. I rely on those organisations and bodies to give advice about whether or not a procedure should be banned. And they have said it should not. Now, I, where I do agree with you is that the way that they have gone about their communication and their evidence session, I understand that and I saw it as well. And I think there is absolutely a... Uh, a need for the MHRA to, to look into all of that. And I've written to Jeremy Hunt asking for his view, because obviously there's a report coming to NHS England in the summer about MESH uh, that will be um, uh, further, uh, of further importance in terms of what that says for NHS England. But in terms of what the MHRA's position is in all of this, whether they were devolved or reserved, if their recommendation about a medical device to me as a Cabinet Secretary, uh, is to ban or not to ban, then I would have to follow that, because on what basis would I not? I can understand that. But on what it, basis but, would I not? But I come back then to the evidence you've given, which has been that no ban was possible because the MHRA is a reserved body. That actually really is a convenience, because what you're saying is the fact it's reserved is irrelevant. If that body had not made, had made, not made that recommendation to you, you would not implement the ban. And well, that is the point I'm getting yeah, to. And so I, I and want I to ask, ask you, Cabinet yeah, Secretary, yeah. given how dissatisfied there has been expressed the whole conduct of the MHRA and all of this, and even the reservations I think you've expressed, what steps have you taken to have these matters devolved to the Scottish Parliament? Well, we want all matters devolved yeah. to the Scottish Parliament. I would be very happy for the powers of the MHRA to be devolved, and we will continue uh, to make those arguments about that and many other matters. But, you know, well, we have, have to separate though. out the conduct of the MHRA and the, the recommendations they make. Whether or not we think the conduct of the MHRA is right or wrong, their recommendation determines whether or not a medical procedure can go ahead or not. And whether that's devolved or reserved, as a politician, on what basis would I reject that recommendation? I think we would be into very serious territory if I was deciding what procedures were to go ahead or not, what medicines we um, have or don't have in use in the NHS. These are matters that we rely on clinical expertise to determine, and I would hope you would ac accept uh, that limitation in terms of the power I would have. I accept it to, the, to this extent, but surely as politicians, if we see a body that we feel is not acting appropriately 
and whose conduct of an investigation we believe not to have been comprehensive in a way that inspires confidence as politicians, that is something on which we should then intervene. And we haven't. And, and, and every time those concerns were raised about the MHRA, I have communicated those concerns in the strongest terms about the evidence session and about concerns that you yourself raised within Parliament. Each and every time I raised those concerns with the body. Directly. Can I just ask if the logic of your position is then, if you had been Cabinet Secretary for Health at the time when this issue emerged, you would not have called for an independent review because you can't second guess the work of the regulatory body? But the independent review was to look at the, uh, a number of issues surrounding MESH. It was to look at what the guidance would be to health boards, what it is we're asking clinicians to do in terms of following the best evidence and guidance. But I think to, to say that in some way the independent review could have banned a procedure that is not a banned procedure across the UK, is it, it could not have done that. It what could, it, it could it, have what said, with respect, possibly they wouldn't spend public money on it. Yes. Well, it the clinical evidence that has been gathered as part of the independent review process is the clinical evidence. What I'm saying is it was probably never going to meet the understandable expectations that many of the women had that have written to me saying that we wanted a ban. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is that was probably never going to be the expectation that was going to be met through the independent review process because what the independent review process was really going to look at was the evidence of when MESH should and should not be used within the NHS here in Scotland. Okay. Rona Mackay. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, at topical questions on the 7th of March, you said that at the end of all this, we must make sure that whatever guidance is given to the NHS and clinicians, it's based on the most robust evidence. I wonder if you could um, tell us what, the most, what constitutes the most ro robust evidence and how will that evidence base be reviewed to ensure it reflects the most up-to-date information? Yep. Well, I'll ask Catherine to come in with some of the, the detail around the evidence, but uh, whether it's from the interim report to the final report, Obviously, a lot of evidence has been uh, looked at through the independent review process. Uh, some of that evidence uh, was um, external reports that became uh, into uh, the public domain in between the interim and the final reports. And all of that has been uh, looked at by the independent review uh, process. It's fair to say that there were clinical disagreements around that, and I think those have been well um, aired in terms of the, the view of um, one clinician being different from the view of the other clinicians. As I've said previously, that's not necessarily unusual, but given the controversy and the strong feeling uh, around this issue, um, it has taken on um, uh, um, additional uh, significance. If I could maybe ask Catherine just to say a little bit about the evidence and how that has been handled by the independent review and importantly what then happens with that in terms of the guidance to, to boards. So one of the reasons for the delay between the interim review and the final publication was waiting for several very large pieces of evidence. A European study which was looking at the safety of the use of MESH and the PROSPECT trial which has a long-term follow-up of the use of MESH in prolapse. It's the, the, the evidence from that PROSPECT trial which has led the conclusion about the use of MESH in vaginal prolapse not to be used except, and, and the full um, text in the chapter actually says, must not be used routinely, may only be used in complex situations, and then only with the agreement of the full multidisciplinary team. So that evidence, which was well worth waiting for, is led us in the community, the clinical community, to completely change the way we would talk to women about having mesh for vaginal prolapse. So that we will not discuss the use of mesh except in very complicated uh, examples of prolapse. So uh, we will only use native tissue to repair prolapse when women are coming forward with symptoms. As for stress urinary incontinence, that the evidence again, we've waited to to collate as much evidence as possible because we know these trials are going to be published. We have publication dates. Again, well worth waiting for those because we now have a much broader body of evidence where the 
complication rates can be discussed with women with the most up-to-date evidence. What I have asked is that our current information for patients is completely reviewed. We do have a standard leaflet at the moment for stress urinary incontinence, but of course that now needs to be updated. We have, we have the instruction to medical directors about the mesh not to be used for vaginal prolapse. So we would expect the oversight group to keep reviewing the evidence that comes forward, but also to review the data which ISD is collecting for us. We have new codes, so again, after the women bringing this petition forward, we have made changes because we realised that our coding for these procedures was not adequate. It did not reflect the complications. It didn't, as the women will, will um, affirm, it did not uh, talk about removal properly. It did not talk about the number of procedures that women were having. And so those codes have now been revised. Those will be used in ISD to collect all of our data going forward. And I expect the oversight group to look at those data of, of use of mesh, but also for procedures that are not using mesh across Scotland. So does that then mean that you um, agree with the petitioners that the, the, the final review, which you're saying is going to be progressively updated, um, doesn't strike the right balance? It doesn't re reflect their, their experience of the procedure uh, as much as it should? Well, absolutely not. So what I have met with women since all of this process started, and I've listened to their stories, and their stories very clearly are... You can see them, hear them from them themselves, but they're very clearly documented. So what we know is that there are women who have had mesh who shouldn't have had that mesh inserted into them because they weren't properly consented. So they didn't have a full description of what might happen in the worst case scenario to them. And for that, I have already apologised because no one intends as, as a clinician to harm patients, to harm women. So we have moved from that situation to needing to find out more about exactly what this mesh was doing to women. So at the time that, that um, some of the women had the procedures done, the full evidence wasn't available. The clinicians were working on the, ev the evidence they had, but some of it was very short, short term. Mesh has only been used for around 10 to 15 years. So this evidence that we now have is is but being partly because of the brave efforts of the women in flagging this up, the need for more research and the need for long-term complications to be followed up. So we have, we have changed the way that we're talking to women who come forward. And we must remember that around 50% of all women will have incontinence at some stage in their lives. So this is an extremely common condition. It is very, in, in some cases, very life-limiting. It, it restricts people, so they, they, come, they come forward Sorry. to... What I'm trying to get at is that given the level of risk involved, and it's been now moved to a, a Category 3, would it not have been safer just to say, let's not do this? Let's, let's. So, so in that when women are coming forward, as I say, this is common, so a lot of women come forward. Those with particularly severe symptoms will be referred up to, to hospital to either a gynaecologist or a urologist to discuss their symptoms. In some cases, those women will have such severe symptoms that they want to have something done. And what we have laid out at reading that they've laid out in this review is that all options must be offered. So for some women, they will have no treatment at all at their decision, a shared decision between them and their clinician. But for other women, what we want is that there are all the options with all of the complications, all of the risks, all of those things that these women were not fully aware of because at that time they did not have what would, we would now see as fully informed consent. Okay, can we uh, move on in modest Corey? Yeah, um, <clears throat> as I say, uh, ladies, um, with regard to the reliable, with the shared decision tables, are you content that all the relevant information is clear, reliable, and easily accessible for all those who need to use it in considering the treatment options? And also, does it sufficiently support informed decision making on the part of the person seeking treatment? I throw it open to it. Well, well, I understand. Um, 
a, a lot of the discussion that um, was had at the, the previous session around the way that information has, has been presented within the report and the changes between the interim report and the final uh, report. Uh, and I understand uh, like all of the information is there in some form, but it is there in a different way than was initially there in the interim report. And the chair has explained uh, the rationale uh, behind that. I understand the complexity of it. I think it's not an, a particularly an easy report to read, which is why uh, there is a commitment to uh, produce a, a, um, an easier to understand a, a version of the report. I think that's the right thing to do. Uh, and again, I think that's something that Professor Britton should look at in terms of the the type of uh, information, when it is complex information, uh, which is, some of it is ve very clinically complex, and the way that is then translated into a public-facing report, I think is something that we should, that should be looked at through uh, Professor Britton's work. Uh, Catherine, do you want to say a little bit about the evidence team? So the, I think the way the review is... In the interest no. of time, okay. if you've got a particular view on that, we could maybe, no can maybe write us about that, but I think that the... The points that the Cabinet Secretary probably cover it. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the, my reason for asking this question, Cabinet Secretary and, and Dr Colwood, is if it has been reported that there are only 27% of surgeons are reporting, well, sorry, surgeons are uh, reporting only 27% of the MESS procedures, and therefore I have a concern about the reliability based on that low rate uh, of the information you're basing some of your decisions on. Can I ask Catherine to respond to So I, I'm also very concerned about that. And my um, letter, which was followed immediately after the publication of the review, I wrote to the medical directors. And what I, I have it here, and I have provided a, a, a copy for the committee for you to see afterwards. So I've said that the report provides clear guidance on the use of MESH for the two clinical indications. At all times, information must be shared with patients and mandatory reporting by clinicians of procedures to a recognised database. In accordance with the General Medical Council guidance, adverse events involving MESH as a medical device must be reported. So I've spoken personally to all medical directors. They received my letter and have welcomed it, and they have since been asked to confirm with me their arrangements for starting to audit all of this, these procedures on a recognised database, so that a surgeon will not be able to do the procedures unless they are recording their outcomes, including complications, on a recognised database. Medical directors have all said that they will support that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Neil Finlay, briefly. I have no doubt um, that um, suffering from incontinence or prolapse is a completely miserable experience, but it does not lead to the loss of your job, your home, your career, your marriage, your ability to walk or enjoy a life. And uh, I think this report simply does not cut it. We, we have the chairs did not meet each other. I find that absolutely remarkable that the people heading up this inquiry did not meet each other for whatever reason. We have members of the committee, uh, the, the, the review group, who did not uh, attend meetings for 10 months, were never included in agendas or minutes, asked for them and were not received. We have uh, the Nature rep uh, published report on adverse incidents omitted. We have the EU reclassification omitted. The FDA advice note omitted. The original report completely changed uh, um, it, when it, the final report was published. And we have FOIs that I have put into your department that have still not been released to tell us what's been going on. Now, this is going to be the biggest litigation against the NHS in Scotland's history. This review simply does not cut it, Cabinet Secretary, and I think you need to act, and you need to act and now to do something about that, because all of that information about EU classification, new information that's came forward since the review and before it was published has been omitted. This is not good enough. Um. Can I say to, to Neil Finlay, um, obviously since um, the report there has been the, the reclassification uh, on the, the 5th of, of April, um, which uh, has um, obviously been, was been something that was in the offing 
uh, and anticipated, but um, actually happened on the, the 5th of uh, April. It was, no, it was the 5th of April, um, the European... The 5th of April, the European Parliament reclassified MESH. Um, Cabinet Secretary, can I just say that the, the date that we were given as a committee mm -hmm. was the 8th of March? Yes. And Trace Gillis confirmed the 8th of March that that, well, that was the date? I've seen the, the paper from the European Parliament and it's the 5th of April on the, on the paper that I've seen. Can I ask if it was a surprise to you that the, um, the independent review didn't reflect that movement at all? Well, as I understand, the independent review talked about the anticipation yes. of of that, mm. but obviously it hadn't would, been would there confirmed. Have been any, would there have been any issue if they had come to you and said, we want to delay publication post whatever the date was that the reclassification was going to be announced by the European well, Commission? If they had Could they have said to you, you know what, this is coming up, this might affect what we want to say in our report. It's quite a significant issue. You had reflect on it yourself. We would not expect a report to... Clearly, the interim report the final report was delayed until the, was the prospect report was concluded. Mm -hmm. So this would have been a reasonable thing. And if they had asked you that, would you have acceded to that request? If, if the, the chair had asked for more time in the light of, of that or any other report that was coming out, then, then of course. Uh, would it have been reasonable for you, informed by the chief medical officer, to say this report has come out ahead of this announcement? Could you now reflect on that and add it into your recommendations and reconvene for one meeting to see if oh, this was significant? I mean, I understand that the report does refer and reflect to what they anticipate was going to be the, the change in classification. Um, I, Catherine, I don't know whether... Um, so the, the, what the, the expectation was it would be reclassified to Class 3, and the report reflects that, that, that in, in draft, it was in draft consideration with the European Parliament. So we, we, we didn't have that date. We can provide you with the European Parliament um, decision to the committee. Can I, the, sorry, I'm, I'm, I don't want to talk this. Is the decision of the European Commission material to this question? Well, I think it Does was it anticipated, matter? as Catherine is saying, it was anticipated by the independent review that this would be happening, that this would be reclassified. It's just the fact that it hadn't actually happened. So the report is written from the point of view of recognising that was likely to happen, as I understand yes. it. Correct? It, it. It's important also to realise it, it's the reclassification of all surgical meshes, not just vaginal mesh. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll send you the information we have about the European Parliament. Can I just say on the FOIs, it, the, as you'll understand, there was a, a, a great number of FOIs and that involves a lot of information just to reassure you that we will be responding to that as quickly as possible but you, it obviously is a great deal of information that, that's been requested from your office and that's going to take time to, to gather that information but that will be uh, issued to you as quickly as possible. Okay, okay. Um, Brian Whittle. Thank you Chair. Um, in the report, Conclusion 8 says that in cases of pelvic organ prolapse, mesh procedures must not be offered routinely. Cabinet Secretary, during your statement to Parliament on the 30th of March, you referred to these recommendations as clear, unambiguous and incredibly important. I wonder then if you can make it clear and unambiguous what is meant by must not be offered routinely, because surely that phrase is open to interpretation. Yeah. Um, so the, the full wording is that the use of uh, polypropylene mesh or biological graft should not be offered routinely, but may be considered in complex conditions only after discussion at an appropriate constituted MDT. I think Catherine Calderwood earlier on alluded to, you know, there may be uh, exceptional cases where there is absolutely no other treatment available to the women who, in the full knowledge of and explanation uh, of what those risks are, uh, decides uh, to go ahead because there is no other treatment available. So it will be exceptional circumstances. And the MDT is really important here because it's then not just about that clinician's view, it would be the multidisciplinary team uh, that would discuss it. Catherine, do you want to? 
So we would only anticipate this in, in a very few cases in Scotland. It would usually be a case of procedentia. That's where the whole womb is outside the body. There's no other way of, of keeping that tissue from being outside the woman's body. We can do a hysterectomy where we remove the womb, but then sometimes what happens is the vaginal vault prolapses. It's extremely uncomfortable. It causes terrible urinary problems. And, and the, the, the only treatment that will suspend that tissue inside the woman's body in exceptional circumstances would be mesh. And that would be the, the, the circumstances under which I would expect it to be used other forms of prolapse, we have also said in the, in the, read in the full chapter that it must only be native tissue used, no mesh. I think my, my point, though, is that is, is the phrase not open to interpretation. That, well, that's, that's the point. It's, it's not absolutely rigid and clear. So that's why um, the work that Catherine is doing with medical directors is making it very clear um, about the exceptional um, cases and when this would be used and that in terms of the, the the reduction in the number of surgeons who would carry out these procedures, all of which is um, about tightening up on uh, making sure that the, the procedures are only used, first of all, with the full consent and understanding of the women in terms of the risks and looking at all of the other options. And in that case, as Catherine said, we're talking about very, very specific circumstances where no other treatment is available and the women must fully understand the risks. So tightening up on all of that will, um, will I think, be very, very important. And Catherine's taking that work forward with the medical directors. Okay. Thank you. Angus MacDonald. Okay, uh, thanks, Convener. If I could go back briefly to um, the, the issue of mandatory uh, reporting. Um, Dr Calderwood, uh, you've mentioned your letter to medical directors and health boards, um, I think dated the 27th of March, which we, we do have a copy of. We just got it um, uh, during the meeting. Um, and I believe that was cascaded. It was, there was instruction to cascade that down to GP practices uh, as well. Uh, and it sets out your expectation of clinicians uh, stating at all times mandatory reporting of uh, procedures um, which must be made to a recognised database. So when do you expect the IRIC procedure to, to be in place with regard to mandatory uh, reporting? So they, um, I... And um, will there be a consistency with regard to the level of information that's recorded? The IRIC has been in place. It's our Scottish way of reporting any kind of adverse incident, not, not only for MESH. What we have evidence of, and again, due to the women drawing this to our attention, is that they were able to give a number of complications, a great many women who had complications, and when we looked at the IRIC data, there were tiny numbers being reported through that system. So what we know is that clinicians don't report when they should, and there isn't a full understanding of the types of complications they should be reporting. So again, I'm taking this forward with medical directors. We are going to have many fewer surgeons performing these procedures because you'll also say that, see that I have said that each surgeon must perform a minimum of 20 procedures a year. So each medical director will know by name who is performing those procedures. We'll have the data on the database that I've described already so that we know the numbers and the complications will also be recorded. So those clinicians will then need to further report those complications to IRIC, to an external adverse review. Um, so we will, we will then use those data in the oversight group as we monitor what is happening and what complications are happening in Scotland in the future. So what's the timeline? Is it in place now? Or? So it's, be, it's been in place. It is already in place. And through my, I've already met with all of the medical directors who have uh, cascaded these instructions to their, th into their health board uh, staff that are performing, uh, discussing these the, uh, procedures that are being performed, not only, of course, ones with mesh, but the other procedures, so that they have, been, have heightened awareness of the need to report any complications to IREC. <coughs> Okay. And is there any procedure, any sanction if they don't report? The so we have the GMC revalidation, which has, is based on yearly appraisals. I've also discussed with the medical directors that they will discuss the, the data 
for these surgical procedures so that each surgeon is bringing, this is the number of procedures I've performed, these were the complications, and then they would be asked, did you report those complications as per the IRIC uh, criteria for reporting of adverse incidents? So through an, a yearly appraisal, which then every five years is necessary to have a doctor revalidated so that we can be, have a license to practice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think at the heart of the concerns about this report are the perception that it may not have been as independent or independent uh, and the second one is the issue of the ban. I think these are the two core concerns that people have. On the first one, can I just go back to the original question by Angus MacDonald, because I think this is something that Professor Britton needs to look at. When Leslie Wilkie resigned and was replaced by Tracy Gillis, with all due respect to Catherine, I don't think it really matters whether she was medical director of a health board that did or didn't do meshes. The point was, at the time, she was an employee of the National Health Service. And therefore, the perception is that um, this is an inside job, not an independent report. And I think one of the lessons for the future is how do you define what an independent report is and who are independent members? And, you know, looking back, maybe the MH MHRA shouldn't, I mean, my fault, shouldn't have been on the committee review for the same reason. So I do think there's an issue there. So that leads me to the question, who actually drafted the report? Who actually sat down at the computer and drafted the report? So let, let me take the, the first, the first mm -hmm. bit. I, I, I agree. I think sometimes perception can be everything. Yeah. And it's very difficult once a perception is, um, is, is there um, to, to change that in, in any way. And I think, you know, I, I could sit here all day and, uh, you know, perception is a perception. And uh, I think we absolutely have to learn the lessons that, um, that as you've pointed out, who, who sat on the review, who <clears throat> was invited to, to take part in the review, who, um, what were their expectations, what was the remit, what was the, uh, the, the roles and responsibilities of, of each and every one uh, within that independent review. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I think <clears throat> that Professor uh, Britton should look at uh, all of that and if there are lessons to be learned around how even though well, people still might disagree with future independent rev review uh, conclusions, mm. we might end up with a different subject in the same, the same uh, place because people disagree with the conclusions. If they feel um, that, you know, that everything has been done in the right way in terms of process, then I think that um, it would be very helpful in, in countering um, the, uh, the, the, the perception and allegations that have been made around, around this review. So Professor Britton absolutely uh, needs to do that, and I think that's um, going to be very, very important going forward. In terms of the, the drafting of the report, Catherine, um, I understood that was through the, the chair. Yes, and the, 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 the review group, they, they wrote section. I, I understand, I wasn't the there, obviously. The clinicians wrote the cl clinical so section, so and then... The draft wasn't written by the civil servant or written <coughs> by somebody like that. It was written by the members of the committee, is that right? <laughs> Well, so that's my, understanding. that's my understanding. Certainly, the the Thanks. chair, as I understood, wrote the the kind of overview part because yeah. uh, I think she wanted. Well, there was obviously the the the, the leading and recognising some of the difficulties. So, I, as I understand, that that was very much her her reflection. Uh, the clinicians wrote the the, the clinical bit. And uh, you know, so I think different people drafted different parts of right. the report, so, as I understand. So I think I think it'd be useful just to get a breakdown of that right, and find okay. out who who really was who were, who were the authors of the various bits of this report, because I think that would answer some questions or not about uh, the reliability in people's minds of the report. Can I just ask, because obviously um, I don't <clears throat> think he's spoken publicly, uh, but what were the stated reasons for, because as well as um, uh, Olive and Elaine resigning from the committee, obviously a consultant resigned mm -hmm. from the committee. Mm -hmm. Why did he resign from the committee? <clears throat> so um, obviously um, need to, the, the person hasn't uh, been named in the public domain, so no. I'll just talk about the clip. 
<clears throat> okay, so let's talk about the clinician. The clinician, um, as I understand the main reason for uh, his resignation was a disagreement with the other clinicians about the evidence. In his view, his, his um, preference was for a procedure called... Colpo suspension. Colpo suspension. He felt that that should be the main um, procedure right. offered to women. The other clinicians disagreed and said that that should be one of the options, but the other options should be offered to women. I think if you boil it down, there's probably other issues, but to me, from looking at it from what I understand, uh, that has been the main issue, uh, that, he, uh, that there was a, a fundamental disagreement around that issue and that uh, that led to, to his resignation. So that kind of leads me on to the next issue of the ban, uh, because my understanding, Catherine can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is uh, that in some jurisdictions, particularly, for example, in Australia and parts of North America, there has been a ban imposed. Uh, is that right? So I think it's a it's restriction on use, which is much as we are right. recommend uh, as the recommendations are here. Right. So it's not there's no not fear a, where there's a total ban. No. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I, right. that's my understanding. It's not a total ban. Are we sure ban. about that? I can I can certainly uh, clarify right. that for you. Because yes. certainly, you know, I'd been told there had been parts of Australia where there had been a total ban, but I think mm -hmm. that so information would be quite out. useful, can convener. Can I mean, we yes. can certainly we can look into right. that, but obviously, you know, they'll have their own regulatory regime that are yes. equivalent to the MHRA, um, although we would expect um, all of them to be drawing from similar evidence bases yeah. in terms of the recommendations well, they well, make. Well, that, that was my point. If, if there is evidence that, yeah. you know, there is a ban, you know, if why did they do it and we're not doing it and you know what lessons can we learn from them yes. <coughs> yeah okay. i think the whole committee actually right probably. To the yes. okay yes, of course thanks very much now are there any final very brief questions from the committee Aye. brian uh, th thank you chair I, I think you know the gathering of evidence is, is crucial in, in any review and how that's gathered and i think there's concerns around uh, the raised today around the consistency across NHS boards uh, of reporting of adverse events and also questioning the consistency in the guidelines of what constitutes uh, an adverse you know uh, event uh, is that something that that could be a, a better a better address well we've already been working with uh, boards around the reporting of adverse events in relation to actually something un completely unrelated to mesh but around the adverse e um, event reporting uh, regarding uh, maternity mm. uh, service obviously the issue emerged with the nation and Aaron and it has brought to my attention that there needed to be um, the implementation of what is clear guidance actually to boards around adverse events, but they actually needed to implement that. So work is going on with boards around making sure that what they classify as an adverse event is, is the same uh, and that how they report that adverse event is the same. Um, that will be strengthened by the, the duty of candour legislation that's coming in uh, next year, which will be a, a requirement in law around the information that is put into the, the public domain around adverse event reporting. But Catherine, do you want to add in? So, so we, 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 need, we, we know that it hasn't been adequate, hasn't been standardised. In this particular um, topic, we will have the oversight group, which will then produce guidance which is standardised and will scrutinise those adverse event reports. So, but in, in, the, in the wider... Um, adverse event reporting, <laughs> Healthcare Improvement Scotland has done a lot of work recently to try to improve the, both the level of reporting and to standardise that, and more importantly, of course, to use those adverse events to look at those, to learn lessons so that we can improve the services. Okay, Jackson, very briefly. Um, at, at the meeting um, that uh, Elaine uh, Holmes and Olive McElroy had with the Cabinet Secretary following the resignation, they drew to your attention the fact that there was still out-of-date information uh, residing in a number of uh, NHS facilities and GP surgeries. And I think you gave an assurance at that point that you would take steps to have that removed and updated. Are you able to give an assurance today that that has now happened and that no out-of-date literature is still being circulated? So what I can certainly assure you is that when there are discussions occurring, as per my letter, which um, Angus MacDonald has pointed out, was cascaded right down to, to, to G, right through the system to GP practices as well. So that when there are discussions, everybody has received this letter and should be 
should be talking to women using the up-to-date information from the review. What I, 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 I cannot say that there won't be an out-of-date leaflet that's sitting in a GP surgery. There are out-of-date OK magazines and all sorts oh. sitting in... No, I, sorry, I, I didn't mean that to be... Faci I didn't... I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. Could I didn't mean that. Come to back down again? I didn't mean that. I'm sorry. I did not mean that to sound as it has been interpreted. I, 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 I would not want to assure this committee that you wouldn't find an out of date information leaflet in a GP surgery or a, a, a hospital. But what I do know is we have, we have made sure that the information is available to those who will be discussing the women's problems with them. And we're striving to make sure that's not the case, but I think you would appreciate that you know, it would be difficult for me to give assurance that there may not be an out-of-date leaflet somewhere uh, in a GP surgery, but we are working hard uh, with uh, health boards, trying to disseminate through to GP practices to avoid that happening where at, at all possible, but it is work in progress. Okay. Happy Thank to you. keep you updated about Can that. Can I just ask two very brief points at the end? First of all, um, and if we don't have time for you to respond in full, are you concerned that there was full sign-up to the, end of the interim re review and then the final, re final report's clearly not been able to, to gather that? And secondly, there was some um, discussion at the earlier session with the Chair about your, your reporting and request that the information that the women had provided to the report be removed. My understanding is that you asked for that to be done and it wasn't done. And I wonder whether it may be that you want to reflect on what Tracy Gillis has said to us, mm -hmm. but it would be good if you could come back to us now, because I think that was something that we were concerned about, the request made to you, that you then pursued with the chair, which didn't seem to be um, accepted as quite significant, that what they had contributed to the report should be removed, mm -hmm. because <clears throat> to, not to put words into their mouth, but the sense that, that having participated, their participation was almost then being used as a means of them having part of a process which they then didn't agree with. I, I understand that, and, I, and we talked at length about this when I, when I met with uh, the women on the 16th of, of March. We talked in detail around a number of, of these issues. Um, they, we, they also mentioned their, um, their support for the interim report uh, compared to obviously the final report and I understand that that's still though important to recognise that there are recommendations in the final report not least the the one that we've talked around around mesh for prolapse which are important the mandatory reporting wasn't in the interim report was in the final report so um but I understand uh, and and heard what what the women said about their, uh, their support for the interim report compared to the final report. In terms of the information, um, I, uh, when I met with the, the, the chair um, on the, the, the 22nd of March, I relayed to her all of the concerns, really, that the women had raised. Um, she then contacted the women to ask about a number of pieces of information um, and uh, to seek clarity about what should be uh, removed. Um, the women then responded, I think it was on the 23rd of March, uh, with a list of information they wanted to remove, and it was then ultimately the chair's decision, really, about whether or not to accede um, to to that request and she has clearly agreed with some of that and agreed to remove for example the minority report and she gave her reasons earlier uh, about why she didn't remove the other uh, material now you know it's not my report it was an independent re report and it was for the chair uh, to make that decision but I did relay uh, to the chair the concerns that the women had and raised. It may be that we're going to have to write you about that because I think there's a sense that people thought that you were going to be at least indicating your support for the material being removed. But I appreciate. But, I think it'd be useful for you to look at the exchange okay, I will um, in do committee, that, and, and we can yeah. also pursue that further yeah. because I'm genuinely, you know, concerned about time. That, and I do appreciate um, this is such a significant issue for so many people. We don't want to lose the opportunity to just to get it absolutely right. Okay. So, given that we're nearly sort of ten minutes away from. I would stop altogether. Can I thank you, Cabinet Secretary and the Chief Medical Officer, for your evidence? What we will now do is look at what, how we think it should be um, taken forward. And I would say to you, there are further things you want to feed into the committee in the next period. I think that would um, be helpful. I mean, my sense is that um, this issue about 
they get the difference between the interim report and the, the final report getting um, agreement is so significant. I do think we should be asking the petitioners to come back and give oral evidence. Yeah. I think it would be worthwhile um, asking everyone who was on the review group, whether they resigned or not, to express their, you know, to take the opportunity to give us evidence um, about how they feel the conclusions um, were reached and to the extent that they want to do that, that would be a matter for them. I think that would be useful. Are there other suggestions that people have? Convener, um, I think fairly firstly we should reflect on the, the evidence we've heard today, uh, a great deal of, uh, of extra or additional information, um, and clearly the, the, the view of the petitioners um, should, should be sought. However, in the meantime, um, I'd be quite keen to, to instruct our, our committee clerks to seek time uh, for a debate uh, of this serious issue in the, in the Chamber of the Parliament to allow other members of the um, of the parliament to to raise um, issues that they no, no doubt have. Um, we've had a ministerial statement on the 30th of March. Um, however, I feel a parliamentary debate is justified. Now, I'm not sure uh, if that can be diaried before recess or not, but um, I think a full debate in the chamber is long overdue and um, should be explored further. Well, we can certainly explore that with uh, the conveners committee, but there are a limited number of slots for um, committee debates. But it, I'm sure the Scottish Government will also be aware that we, we think this is a good and important debate. So it may be that they can, through the Cabinet Secretary, be something that could be flagged up to the, to the business manager. Um, are there anything else that we think? I mean, I think we're agreed. This is certainly not a petition that we want to close. We think there's further information, further concerns that need to be. Um, sort of addressed, and some of those are the ones I've suggested. Is there anything else? I think that's I, I fully support the, the debate uh, in the chamber, and I think you know what we've said is just to, to get more evidence. I would be really keen to hear from the members of the group, um, and also the MHRA. I think we've already well, heard from them. No, we have, right, okay. I suppose one thing we, we do want to ask the class, class bearing in mind that the, the, the comment made by Alec Neil was whether these regulatory powers are coming to the, the Parliament or not. And if they are, then it would be something that we can then ask the Scottish Government they might want to, to do. Because I think, in so many, my sense, in so many of these issues, is where is, where is the, the authority of the clinician stop? And it's very difficult when somebody says it's a clinical decision, we all have to say fair enough. But at the same time, I was highlighted by Alec Neil other questions about even although there's a clinical or that it exists in regulatory terms, does that then mean that the National Health Service has to sanction it? So just trying to understand how that works would be useful. Can, maybe clarify, convener, is a, if there are any waiver powers. I mean, a, a, a parallel example, I'm not saying parallel in the sense that I, I don't know now what the up-to-date position is with the, the regulatory given the new powers. But if you take housing, for example, we didn't have the power to licence the PRS sector. I, I, I understand we now have that power if we want to use it. So clear, but that would, none of us would know that from the way the legislation is presented at Westminster. So I think it'd be useful just getting a, a legal update, advisory update on what the scope there is for repatriating the MHRE powers uh, under the new legislation, if there is any. Brian? I think, um, I think for, for, for me, um, convener, uh, there's been more questions than, than answers uh, today. And I think... I think um, listening to the, the testimony, to, testimony today, uh, especially in the first round, there's, there were so many there was so many blank spots that, uh, that, that, that I certainly would. I, I mean, I need time to reflect on everything that we've heard today. Without doubt, we need to hear from the petitioners again to hear their views uh, on the review and what happened between the interim and the final review. And I've got to say, I do support um, Angus, Angus uh, Macdonald's call for a, a debate in the chamber because, uh, as I said, some, somehow or we've got to bring this to some kind of conclusion. Yeah, and uh, as it, so we're really trying to... We, we wanted to take more evidence from petitioners, the stake, other stakeholders we've identified, including people who were part of that review. You know, while the chair changed, there's a group of people who remained. And what is their view? Of, on the way in which the thing changed, and also those who, who resigned. And we will recognise their privacy if they don't want to, 
to say anything either uh, publicly or to the committee, but I think that would be worthwhile just seeking that information uh, from them. Convener also getting an understanding of, and maybe this is more for Professor Britton, but if there are... If if there are members of the committee, if the members of the committee were drafting different sections of the report rather than one person pulling the draft together based on committee discussions, then I think that would be a recipe for a lot of things to happen that necessarily wasn't necessarily sort of endorsed by the entire committee or without realising what they were actually writing up. I think I think that process is a highly unusual one uh, for a, a, an independent one example, review. There is one example where the difference between the, and, and it was before you came in, yeah. where the interim report says that um, basically uh, some women who had adverse effects found they were not believed, and it's as independent views expressed serious concern about that. By the time the final one comes, it says who had aver, in, um, adverse effects felt they were not believed. Mm. Now, this is clearly the same report with different versions. Yeah, exactly. So it's not as if it was a new report exactly. that went exactly. to, the, to, to the final yeah. version. It's not, they've not started again. They've been working on the interim report and, exactly. in my view, softening but, up. But when you end up with more than one author who's drafting the thing, I think it's wide open to, to being problematic. And it's certainly... Un I mean, I've never heard of that before, where the members of the committee actually draft sections of the report. There's usually a secretariat, and I, I'm pretty sure we had agreed a secretariat uh, you know, and, uh, to be independent to, to, to do that. I think we should. Um, well, is that what happened? Uh, we're, right. we're not having a dialogue. Sorry, sorry. It's okay. Everybody's been extremely well behaved. So. <laughs> it's just five minutes before the bell, so we know that everybody starts getting jumpy. Um, just to say that I think we would. It would be useful for us to find that information. But I do note that from. Um, the Cabinet Secretary's letter is one of the things I think the Professor Britton will probably be looking at because it says the management and presentation of evidence. So it may be that that's something that we would we, we can both pursue it, but recognise as something that the independent review would do. So I think there are, there are substantial things there that we can um, pursue, work for the clerks to do, and an opportunity, I think, for people who may have an interest whose voice has not been heard yet to take that opportunity. And um, obviously, we will keep people informed about progress and particularly to petitioners who may wish to respond to this session, give us more information, but we'll also be calling for evidence from you. Can I thank everyone, I'm sorry for keeping you there, Cabinet Secretary, um, for your attendance today. I recognise the, 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 the scale of interest amongst the, the people who are in um, the audience and can I thank you too for uh, sort of abiding by the general constraints of this kind of committee. That was very much appreciated by me and, and I'm sure by other committee members. And uh, can I thank also those non-committee members, MSPs, who also attended today. And can I, with that, can I close the meeting? <laughs>